Dear participants, this lecture is recorded within the project of Jean Monnet Chair at RGSL. And I will introduce this time the EU democratic legitimacy in decision making and also address issues on how civil society is engaged in decision making process of the EU. Other lectures you can also find within the project of the Jean Monnet chair at RGSL. Let's get started. First, we need to understand that the um, engagement of interest groups and civil society depends to largest extent uh, on the level at which this activity is carried out. The EU is supranational, sui generis political system that contains also supranational institutions. So in difference to national level institutions like government, courts, national parliament, here we have a different spectrum of uh, institutional uh, cooperation, but also the level at which decisions are made. So countries partly by becoming members of the European Union also delegate part of their sovereignty uh, to the supranational institutions. And this happens through the uh, ratification process after the accession uh, agreement with the EU is signed. So to one hand, the government is agreeing on uh, this process of delegation of uh, issues of, of sovereignty, but also people do this through the ratification process. So <clears throat> that means that the interest group representation can be seen uh, in two levels. The first level would be the interest group activities, or in other words, we call it lobby. And in the EU, lobby is not considered to be something strange, but rather it is an, uh, uh, the um, legitimacy uh, process where uh, the civil society express their views and their opinions and their input. So it can be done on the national level by influencing governments, and then the governments would then uh, uh, represent the people's uh, views on uh, supranational level. Uh, it can be done through uh, influencing national parliaments, and then national parliaments bring uh, the issue up uh, to the um, union uh, once it is uh, discussed there. But interest representation can also happen directly on, so on supranational level, like from uh, member states to the commission, from member states to the European Parliament, and uh, also influencing uh, uh, different agencies uh, or uh, work in progress uh, when the decision is uh, made or the proposal is, um, is framed. So during this lecture, I will start by in explaining the supranational level uh, of the decision making, so at what stage the civil society can engage, but then also we will look the overall picture and I will end by asking the question, is there a pan-European identity? Because also identity matters. Do people affiliate themselves with European level or they stay in their conviction rather on the national level? And to start with um, a representation issue, so how people feel themselves uh, represented and how it's in political science, uh, this, uh, the, 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 the legitimacy, legitimacy issues of um, direct or indirect representation of people. Uh, 
um, on uh, on different levels, on state level or on federal level. So the European Union is neither federation nor confederation. It is a sui generis political system where the elements of both of the federation and confederation coexist. And possibly the founding fathers of um, the union, uh, of the communities in uh, 1949, uh, they envisage that with time, Europe may become a federation. And then even in Rome Treaty, there was um, um, a phrase of ever closer union put in. So with uh, uh, taking into account that uh, it is a step-by-step -step process, but with time, Europe, uh, the cooperation can reach the levels of federation. So let's look closer into uh, the differences. Why federation? Uh, why confederation? And what are the limits? So um, this lecture is about people, about legitimacy and how people are represented and what are the mechanisms for their representation. So first, uh, people in case of federation are uh, represented through two different channels. First, it is uh, uh, on level of states, and then further on federal level through states, or also from people direct to federal level. And this would be very much uh, easy to explain by uh, how, for example, the United States Act. So, and it also explains uh, election system or a parliamentary representation with two chambers and so on. So this uh, two level uh, representation in federation. Uh, whereas in confederation, people are first represented through states and then states are represented further uh, to the higher level. How can we find these elements in the in the European Union? Well, we can partly recognize that there are elements of confederation in the political system of the EU. For example, <clears throat> EU is not having one single constitution, which would be then the case of federation. So legally, in case of federation, there has to be one legal system basis and one constitution. In the member state, though, we have uh, own constitutions of the EU member states. And then we have treaties on the level of the EU. But this also means that uh, EU is not federation because it has an element of uh, constitutions for each member state and not a single constitution for the union. Also that there is in legislative system of the EU, there is an inbuilt uh, um, inbuilt uh, mechanism of two chamber uh, system uh, where council and the European parliament are equally engaged so that council represents governments and governments are the national interests. And then European Parliament represents directly citizens and citizens' interests. We will speak about the interest representation in um, forthcoming slides. And also uh, the fact that member states uh, are having their national interests close to their heart close to their sovereignty um, and we don't have an, uh, one single budget, we don't have one single army in the EU, so uh, the member states still keep the um, high politics issues uh, at uh, closely at the level of uh, uh, national state interest and it is also um, seen with the uh, distribution of competencies in the treaties. Uh, member states are free to uh, leave the cooperation, leave uh, the EU, and unlike federation, um, and this has also happened with the Brexit, so that um, a member state can withdraw 
uh, were uh, also not possible in, in case of federation. And that um, the um, national flags um, and national sim symbols, national anthems, uh, and all like elements, I, we spoke about constitution, but also identity issues, so how people feel. And this is still uh, very much on the level of member states. And uh, uh, we will end this lecture by asking the question about European identity. Are people feeling more European or more national? And uh, this answers also the question that Anthem and, um, and, and flag was never um, adopted in a treaty as official symbols. They, um, they are... Uh, used, but they are not uh, formulated as official symbols. Uh, at the same time, there are also elements of federation. And uh, uh, for example, the, uh, the fact that EU has different levels of um, administration, it has a, a local and um, municipality level, it has state level, and then it has EU level. Um, so like in uh, uh, federation, the, all these levels of decision making and governance are in place. Uh, the EU has a subsidiarity principle, um, and it is a principle of good, good governance, meaning that the decision should be taken on the most appropriate level. So when decision can be taken on national level, there is no need uh, of the EU level uh, to intervene, say, saying that more efficient decisions are made on national level. And this subsidiarity principle is also part of the treaties. Um, like in federation, uh, the European Parliament is directly elected. So they, there is direct representation. So people uh, every five years elect Parliament and this uh, uh, MEP becomes directly elected to supranational level institution. Um, and this is going beyond uh, the Confederation. And also to a large extent supremacy of law so that uh, the, um, uh, the uh, meaning that the EU laws are always more powerful compared to uh, national law. So EU law prevails. Um, some words about principle of subsidiarity, which is the cornerstone. Um, having explained that the founding fathers uh, were paving way for EU to become, for the community to become a uh, federation, uh, there have been inbuilt mechanisms in the treaties um, also to preserve check and balances in this part. And one of these checks and balances has been principle of subsidiarity. So uh, the article said that under principle of subsidiarity increase in areas which do not fall within its exclusive competence, then union shall act only if and insofar as the objectives of proposed actions cannot be sufficiently achieved by the member state. So here we can see that EU comes in with added value to the member states actions. And we can name like issues, um, uh, environment, we can name like climate change or even migration where uh, issues are so horizontal that member states alone cannot uh, deal with this. Also energy, while energy can be that what is, um, what is good for a, one member state possibly is not good for the whole union. Uh, so principle of subsidiarity has been this um, uh, handbrake for the member states national interests uh, in, um, um, in, in process of keeping uh, still the uh, process uh, away from um, European Union um, facing uh, the model of um, federalism. And here also subsidiarity is to a large extent ensured by the national parliaments. 
Uh, so national parliaments are those who are always scrutinizing government's positions and ensuring that uh, the subsidiarity matters. And there is a principle of yellow card where um, national parliaments together as a group uh, can react on principle of subsidiarity. Uh, and then the commission has to reconsider the proposal or at least to react on the national parliament's joint concern. Principle, another important principle, apart from subsidiarity, is principle of conferral. And Article 5 defines that the EU can act only within the limits of competencies conferred upon it by the member states and the treaties. So this means that EU is actually um, penetrating into the um, legal system, uh, but there is still um, like one third of, of laws coming uh, from national parliaments, whereas about 60, 67% of all um, um, legal um, proposals uh, are originating from the EU under this principle. Uh, but then the principle is also implemented through three articles. Uh, and these articles uh, in uh, the treaty article uh, two to article six explain the um, competences, uh, how this uh, proportion of uh, engagement of the EU is taking place. So first competence is exclusive union competence. And this means that if EU is acting under exclusive uh, union competence, then actually EU has um, the first uh, front seat in adopting a, a proposal and in driving uh, the objective forward through EU legislation or other legal instruments. Um, and then the member states are um, being part of this process, but the first prominent role lies with the EU. And one can understand that uh, issues like common commercial policy or trade um, are in hands of uh, the EU because it is the Commission and the EU that acts on behalf of Union as single personality with the third countries. And by that, by this article, also EU avoids that um, individual member state would start uh, carrying out their individual policies uh, within trade. So exclusive competence also clearly is the one uh, that relates to uh, economic uh, monetary union and Eurozone countries, because this is under supervision of European Central Bank. And the member states do not have um, a huge flexibility uh, in implementing. So the second level of uh, competence is shared uh, where uh, the member states uh, are free to legislate until the EU starts legislating. So partly it is done by member states, but then once EU has started legislating in this specific field, then it is uh, the competence is, is gliding over to the EU. And uh, all, again here, for quite obvious that internal market is um, a, a very much a shared competence because of um, also harmonization of law so that the uh, the um, internal market rules are, are harmonized and do not create any barriers inside the markets. Um, and here we have most of the issues that are proper one issue or uh, uh, common market issues, uh, agriculture, uh, transport, energy, um, and, and environment, cohesion policy, and so on. And finally, 
And we have competencies where the member states still preserve a lot of uh, their own uh, input. Uh, and here it is um, uh, clearly also issues like uh, health issues where member states uh, frame and adopt um, their health policy according to differences in health systems. Uh, culture is among them, tourism, education. So uh, the member states preserve their uh, original uh, individual education systems, but there are uh, principles uh, how to compare uh, the degrees, uh, the so-called Bologna process of diploma um, uh, certification, and uh, so that uh, the students can start their education in one EU country and then uh, uh, by recognition of diplomas, uh, can continue in another. So education systems are uh, nation state driven, but they are uh, also um, aligned across the member states, um, ensuring the principle of free movement of persons and um, here students. This uh, graph explains how the uh, legal acts are adopted. And uh, we will uh, then come closer to uh, why it is important for uh, the subject of this lecture of uh, uh, civil society and, uh, and uh, legitimacy, uh, European legitimacy. Because as we have discussed, 67% uh, of legislative acts are adopted on European level. So we are, uh, to some extent, finding ourselves on the supranational level of decision making, where the member states give input, they participate, but these acts that are adopted on EU level become binding for them on the national level. So here, by adopting these legislative um, proposals, we see engagement of um, member states only on the level of uh, national interests in the Council, uh, because the Commission is framing the proposal and sending this uh, legislative proposal to two legislators, to the Council and to the European Parliament. And as discussed, European Parliament being directly elected, a supranational institution, Commission, again, supranational institution and council intergovernmental with 27 member states representing their national interests. So in case of civil society uh, engaging in this, so they can either uh, target the member states govern governments when they bring the position to the legislative table, or they can go directly to the European Parliament as co-legislator or to the Commission once the proposal is framed. And then um, we will also speak about the uh, legitimacy, legitimacy issues in terms of how much people feel engaged in this and what um, are the triggers of legitimacy inbuilt in this decision-making uh, procedure, um, according to Article 289. So what Article says is that uh, there is a, legal acts are jointly adopted by the European Parliament and the Council, but the proposal, the initiative, is coming from the Commission. This works like following. The Commission is drafting the legal proposal, and then this goes for decision-making, and decision-making is done by the legislators, Council and the European Parliament, and this is called ordinary legislative procedure as previously seen in Article 289. And once adopted, then the Commission becomes an EU law monitor and the delegations of the Commission of Member States would then follow how Member States are transposing EU law in the national, law, national legislation. In case Member States fail to transpose national law, then the European uh, Court of Justice is engaging. 
So this is uh, the, the principle of uh, legislative work, uh, legislative proposal and decision making. And I want now to bring you uh, closer to uh, power relations. So discussion on how uh, the um, institutions who are engaged in decision making interact uh, between themselves and whose interests are represented to understand legitimacy issues. We need to understand who is behind, whose interests are represented. So let's start. The commission is representing general interests of the union. And when the very idea of community uh, working together originated, among five founding member states in 1949, uh, the principle was to create uh, the European community. At that time, it was European coal and steel community, where one authority would represent joint interests of all the member states. So for this reason, like historically, this has developed that the high authority in the 50s, but later that was in the treaties called the commission, is representing interests of all the engaged partners, all engaged member states of the union. And sometimes it's very difficult uh, to distinguish what is a general interest. Uh, is there a one interest? So the commission has always to balance because in Northern Europe, possibly um, uh, the, um, you know, olive growing would not be as interesting as in Southern part of Europe or fisheries are most interesting for countries that are around the uh, uh, the respective sea, whereas the preserving of stock of fish is interesting for Europe as such. And energy issues becoming quite challenging in uh, finding what the general interest of the Union uh, is. So the next, the EU Council, and the EU Council is representing interests of the member states, because council consists of 27 member states, each with their own national interest. And as explained in the beginning, the member states upon joining the EU have delegated part of their sovereignty, but they are sovereign individual member states with their constitutions, with their elected parliaments, with their uh, like uh, the, the governments and uh, governments being accountable to their national parliaments for uh, the interest they are representing. So sometimes uh, the interests by governments representing in, represented in council are very diverging. And the uh, challenge in council is to find uh, the unified uh, conclusion uh, either on a unanimity uh, decision or by qualified majority decision, but to agree upon uh, one position. The European Parliament is representing interests of ideological groups because European Parliament consists of different um, ideologies, ideologies groups, and uh, consequently European Parliament is representing people's interests, not the state interests, but people's interests. So all uh, people who support liberal trade uh, would most likely support EPP group uh, or or liberal group in uh, in um, in the uh, in the parliament and those who are um, keen for climate change uh, um, may see to what political group they align and then this is pan european it's not a uh, member state based uh, representing but this is pan european so uh, people from malta and and people from estonia uh, supporting the same ideology would be represented through uh, uh, the European Parliament. 
And finally, European Council represents, again, government's interests, but to extend that the governments um, are uh, here in European Council represented on the highest political level. These are heads of states and the role of European Council is rather political. European Council is not legislating, but European Council is agreeing on future vision of the EU. It is agreeing on uh, budget, on enlargement, on external crisis or external uh, foreign policy. Uh, so the European Council is highest political format of decision making, but very intergovernmental. Again, national interests are, um, uh, are the ones that sometimes are also limiting the high ambitious uh, uh, highly ambitious uh, uh, agreements because uh, in european council the decision is made by consensus by unanimity by one country vetoing the uh, whole european council cannot agree so after having mapped different interest representation in institutions uh, we already can identify the channels of civil society, how civil society could be best represented. And obviously, from this graph already, you would see that the, the most obvious direct representation would be in the European Parliament. So legitimacy of interests by people are expressed through the European Parliament, where people's people are in, uh, represented. Uh, and then in government, it would be uh, represented through the government to the EU level. And uh, in the commission, in very indirect way, because the commissioners are appointed by governments, but then voted by European Parliament. Um, and um, so most supranational in this picture would be then the commission. In uh, the Treaty of Functioning of European Union, we have an uh, article that lists the um, institutions, the formal institutions of the EU. And we have discussed the um, representation uh, at, at what level each institution through people is represented. But as explained, uh, the most obvious direct representation of uh, civil society um, that also ensures legitimacy of decision-making process in the EU is through the European Parliament. So here um, it is also saying that actually we can uh, trace this through treaty because European Parliament is official institution. So therefore, the legitimacy is inbuilt in a treaty. And the European Parliament has two um, locations, two seats. Uh, the main seat of European Parliament is in Strasbourg. And uh, also um, the, uh, the working place um, in Brussels. So in Strasbourg, the Parliament goes for uh, plenaries. And, and otherwise the committee work is carried out in Brussels. And here you see also on the slide, the, um, uh, the, the main hall of the um, Strasbourg uh, building, uh, where 750 parliamentarians are seated and represent political groups. So ideologies, political groups of the union. As explained, uh, the article also um, said that the European Parliament is directly elected. Citizens are directly represented at union level in the European Parliament. So this ensures, because European Parliament is official institution of the EU and citizens are directly represented in this institution, so this ensures legitimacy of decision-making. Um, we will discuss uh, the issue about activity or turnout of uh, the uh, population 
uh, every five years when the parliament is elected, directly elected by citizens. And in the Union, the European Parliament election is carried out through the member states. So each member state is, during the interval of dates, organizing its um, uh, the European Parliament elections. The next elections will be 2024. And uh, uh, the question will be how high the activity of um, uh, society will be in participating in lectures. And uh, um, we will get there in next slides, but uh, just to explain that in some countries, uh, the um, participation in uh, elections is compulsory. It is, of course, an issue of discussion. Should democratic rights uh, be compulsory? Um, also including actually uh, countries in the EU where um, election is uh, compulsory, like um, in um, just one example in Belgium. But um, it also, um, uh, on, other, on other hand, the um, election, um, participating election is not only a right, but also a responsibility on expressing um, active engagement and participating in a um, democratic process. Uh, and these thoughts um, are why I'm taking up an issue of a mandatory participation is because if we see the, the dynamics in um, turnout, how active uh, European citizens have been in participating in European Parliament elections. So we, we see a trend that it started, uh, the first elections of European Parliament were held in 1979, and about 63% of uh, people were uh, participating. And then five years later, the uh, the turnout falled under 60%. And again, five years later, even lower. And again, five years later, um, already approaching 55%. And in 1999, it was only half of population were using their right to represent in direct election process the European Parliament that is legislating the EU law that becomes binding in, in the member states. And the trend has followed down to decrease by 20, uh, 2004 uh, until 2014. This was only 40% of population that went to elections of the European Parliament. And this became a warning signal because on one hand, representation in European Parliament election ensures the le legit legitimacy of uh, decision-making because people are involved. This is a channel of involvement, whereas people themselves actually did not recognize this right and didn't uh, go to, um, to vote for Parliament. And a, a large campaign of information uh, was launched after 2014 elections and thus turned the trend and in 2019 the last elections of the European Parliament uh, was already um, a better result uh, about 48 percent of turnout of the European Parliament elections. So now let's break down this to the uh, level of different member states and see how the figures were across the member states. So we are speaking about recent European Parliament elections in Europe. And um, as we see, the highest turnout was in the countries where the, um, uh, the uh, voting is mandatory, but uh, then um, also um, like countries uh, in Denmark, in Germany, Spain, Austria, Greece, Sweden, it was beyond uh, 50 percent, um, but in uh, Eastern European countries, Slovenia, Czech Republic, Slovakia, it was under 30 percent. Uh, so 
here is still work to do and to turn this trend uh, and possibly a discussion um, is necessary on what exactly um, the reason of low participation in these countries was um, to analyze these trends and to work on this matter for the upcoming elections 2024, because European Parliament is a formal institution deciding on EU laws as a co-legislator and people are directly represented through this institution. So there is a format uh, where just people don't use their rights to be represented. And it's not enough before elections to encourage people to go to vote. So there has to be feeling that people feel affiliated uh, with the uh, European institutions and uh, with the solutions on European uh, level. So what if I go to elect, would it, would it change uh, my situation as a citizen? And for this reason, uh, there was an inquiry made before last elections 2019 asking uh, people to name their concerns. So what are they worried about? And uh, this was a, a, a survey that was made across all the uh, member states before European Parliament elections to understand also how European Parliament should campaign um, on, on what issues the European Parliament should work more once elected. So what are expectations by European citizens? And here, if we just see on the overall uh, slide, the pictures on it. So we see that we have a huge problem and it is about uh, 2019 we are speaking. We have a large um, a majority of people who are concerned about migration. And the further down to South, the the stronger this concern. So you see here in Greece, in Spain, um, a huge uh, concern of the incoming migration. And definitely this is an issue where EU can jointly become um, uh, in, in engaged and, 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 um, and respond to these concerns to a larger extent than on national level only. Uh, the second uh, prominent color in this graph is um, light blue. And this uh, is explaining also concerns about economy and growth. So welfare, in other words, people are concerned about the, their uh, welfare, about the uh, economic uh, situation. And again, EU can do a lot through working on internal market issues, a harmonization on digital single market, on service market. So again, this is a field where EU can, um, uh, can respond to people concerns. And finally, green color on this graph shows the uh, concerns about climate change. And it is also seen that climate uh, concern is mainly in the countries of a high GDP per capita. So we're actually with high welfare standards and these countries are more engaged, uh, people are engaged in climate issues compared to other part of, uh, of, of Europe. So by Looking at this and other issues like uh, social protection or even terrorism uh, threats or youth unemployment, also an, a, a typical issue that was um, specifically concerned for Southern European states before last uh, European elections. So if we would ask these questions today, um, then definitely uh, external borders or uh, security or terrorism would be possibly higher on on agenda, uh, but 
what I want to show with this slide is that we can answer the threats or concerns by, by people on the European level, but it is also important to address these issues uh, through the communication uh, and not only before elections, but throughout the legislative uh, uh, process. So to communicate, to communicate Europe in order to engage people, but also educate. So why not to have a, a, just a, a course on, on, on European Union in, in, the, in the high school? So, next slide. Before 2019 elections, um, we have seen um, a rise of populism. So in some countries, so nation state centric trend of nation state first uh, was put in place. And these countries, these political parties um, were mainly using um, agenda of uh, anti-migration about radicalism against Islam and also partly uh, with, uh, with the um, agenda of um, emphasizing the um, economic crisis as a, a consequence of uh, poor records. So populistic parties mainly were driving these three um, issues uh, for their uh, pre-election campaigns. Whereas the pro-European parties mainly were countering nationalism. So number one, actually countering these populistic parties and voicing issues like climate change, uh, on economic issue, they were quite similar in their expression and and also um, uh, issues like uh, internal market, um, economic welfare um, and, and 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 so, but also e external relations with the EU. So the consequence of differences in uh, uh, national uh, political arena was also reflected in the re election results of the European Parliament uh, 2019. And the consequence was that quite a large number of populistic parties were elected uh, and became part of European Parliament. Some of them even being against EU. So EU skeptic parties became um, elected um, MEPs in the European Parliament. We will discuss it a bit later. Altogether, there are 750 members and um, there's also inbuilt mechanism to balance uh, the large and small countries, a direct representation that uh, the largest country is uh, having a limit of 96 seats in the European Parliament and the smallest uh, of six members. So there is not possible that a like, country like Malta would get lower than six members in the Parliament. And um, the uh, um, number of MEPs is um, related to the size of population. So when the population is changing, then the country can either lose or add uh, members on the, um, at the European Parliament. But there, something happened uh, during this legislative period from 2019 to the next elections, and this was Brexit. And uh, after Brexit, the um, UK uh, leaving, the UK has actually left 73 seats in the European Parliament weekend. And uh, the decision was 
to distribute these seats so that 27 of these vacant seats would go um, to the uh, to balance the number of MEPs uh, in uh, the next elections, including Latvia, that will get with next elections one additional seat. But uh, 46 of these vacant seats were left uh, for the pot potential future enlargements. By that also signaling that in future, uh, the um, enlargement is welcome because in case of enlargement, uh, the limit of 750 seats in the parliament, uh, unless we open the Lisbon Treaty, that the maximum seats is 750. And this graph shows also uh, the changes in um, after Brexit that some of the countries have additionally got uh, uh, the seats uh, directly after Brexit. But as said now, uh, there is another adjustment before next elections in uh, 2024. Uh, the current uh, president of the European Parliament is uh, EPP member, uh, Maltese uh, Roberta Metzola. Um, and she was elected in 2022. And um, also, she will lead the parliament until the elections of 2024 next year, uh, when after elections, the new, the, the new European parliament um, uh, will be designated. And it has to be also uh, pointed out that uh, both high positions European Parliament, but also uh, the president of uh, the Commission and the uh, president of the European Council and high representative, uh, the deal of uh, nominating these high positions is always balanced, uh, taking into account uh, the geographic balance, uh, political background, I mean, ideologically background from European Parliament, uh, also uh, gender um, and and also the, 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 whether the country is a founding member or has joined the EU um, uh, 2004 uh, enlargement or so. So there is the, we are awaiting 2024 uh, uh, quite a considerable change um, in uh, the um, not only Parliament but also the European. Uh, union high positions. Once elected, MEPs from the member states are aligning with the political groups, political parties of the European Parliament. And here in the list of the political groups, um, we see uh, currently that the leading group is European People's Party. Though they lost with um, in comparison to previous elections, but they are still the largest, uh, um, largest group. Uh, so the winner in, in comparison to a previous election was actually uh, the uh, Renew Europe, that increased their participation in the European Parliament with 39% compared to the previous. Um, and uh, this possibly was also on the cost of the drop of um, outcome for um, socialists and Democrats. So the largest two parties, currently political groups are EPP, uh, social, socialists and Democrats, followed by Renew Europe the previous name of you, Renew Europe being ALDE. And then followed uh, by Greens and uh, European Free Alliance, and uh, then uh, right-wing populists, and then Conservative uh, Party, Conservatives and Reformists. Uh, here after Brexit, the number of MEPs in this group has um, um, diminished. But finally, I want to also attract your attention to uh, the, these uh, two other uh, non-attached. So these are parliamentarians who are elected at their uh, national uh, member states, 
but uh, they have had difficulties to find alignment with any of the political groups uh, in the uh, European Parliament. And what I already explained that um, a large number uh, last elections uh, was Eurosceptic populist parties that entered. So 42 parliamentarians actually um, are representing Europe uh, of freedom and direct democracy that is are countering uh, to some extent the very idea of uh, deeper integration. And this is how the current European Parliament uh, political groups are distributed. Uh, so uh, 750 seats and president, so 751 together, and EPP being the largest, followed by SD and, and, and then uh, Renew Europe. And once uh, there is a vote, um, uh, because EPP, um, European Parliament is a co-legislator, and once passing uh, the issues in plenary and for vote, um, they are uh, they need to have um, um, the simple majority outcome on the supporting. So it means that um, definitely the coalition building in the Parliament is is part of of the um, uh, how to say political um influence and this is way how the people um support for these political groups are translated into the decisions through the influence of the political groups on the outcome of the um voting on the legislative act each parliamentarian is at the same time also part of one of the committees. So when the legislative process is carried out, then these committees are adopting um, amendments on uh, um, each uh, legal act, let it be re regulation or directive, and uh, work. the basic work is carried out in the committees. So once we will get back to civil society and interest group engagement, we will see that this slide becomes very interesting because this is a channel through which the civil society lobbyists and interest groups can influence decision-making by targeting the parliamentarians within respective committees in order to influence or to uh, promote their interests on specific dossier. And as an example, I have taken one uh, member of the European Parliament here, um, a Latvian member of European Parliament, Sandra Kalniete, who has been uh, elected from um, National Latvian Party New Unity and uh, aligned with the European Parliament political uh, group, EPP, EPP group. And her portfolio consists not only from, of course, uh, uh, political alignment within this uh, Euro uh, European Parliament uh, political group, but also that he, she's sitting in committees, uh, uh, the uh, Committee of, on Foreign Affairs, a special committee on uh, uh, foreign inf interference in all democratic processes, including disinformation, um, delegation to the EU-Ukraine Parliamentary Association Committee, and um, uh, also being a, a member in other supporting work of other committees. So this is the to understand for you also how then the civil society can be engaged through um, addressing issues uh, through parliaments or through committees or through political channels in the European Parliament. 
there has been a um, trend um, in European Parliament election outcome that in the 90s, uh, the um, majority group that was elected in the European Parliament was socialist uh, ideological uh, group. And it is for the reason that it also reflected the socialist party um, uh, movements in uh, in the member states at that time. So the most uh, political parties governing and getting uh, being elected uh, during um, eight eighties late eighties um, were uh, social democratic parties. But this trend has turned and. Since elections of uh, 1999, uh, the EPP group is taking the lead, and this trend has now been in place. Um, and um, although EPP had a bit of decline during uh, the recent elections, the still EPP is um, a, a leading political group. And here we have to see how this trend will continue in the upcoming elections uh, 2024. How can civil society be engaged through the parliament? So only on the issues that are on the table of the parliament. So where, where parliament has power uh, to uh, to express uh, and influence the outcome, uh, express their interest and influence uh, uh, the outcome. So this uh, would be through a legislative process that we have discussed um, um, extensively during the lecture, but also on budgetary issues. So the parliament has the power to adopt um, annual budget um, and also Parliament is engaged in adopting multi-annual um, um, financial framework. Parliament being directly elected has also the um, supervisory role um, with regard to appointing uh, the commission. So it is Parliament that elects commission president. So they can uh, reject, but they can also elect. So the power of parliament here uh, is indeed balancing towards um, more uh, power to this um, uh, legitimately uh, represented through people um, institution by saying that once parliament has power, it's also through people who are represented in the uh, European Parliament that has right to appoint and elect the commission president. And all commissioners have to undergo um, quite um, extensive hearings on um, taking their uh, their office. So before a commissioner gets elected um, and after being appointed from the government, uh, the, each commissioner has to undergo uh, the um, hearing or, or to be asked and, and scrutinized by the uh, respective European Parliament committee. And also the European Parliament um, has control over uh, the work done by the presidency by um, asking questions, by uh, being informed by the progress. Um, and uh, to, to that extent, um, my point here is that parliament has, in comparison to other supranational institutions, a uh, quite important power um, where also the people are directly uh, represented. There are three types of procedures, how parliament is engaging in legislative process. Most interesting here is 
the one that is ordinary legislative procedure, Article 289, where Parliament is co-legislating together with uh, uh, the Council, and Parliament has three readings. So Council and Parliament has to agree. Uh, uh, if they don't agree on first reading, then the second reading, and finally, Conciliation Committee. Um, so there are time limits, but also the extensive work on uh, because Parliament can uh, veto the decision by um, providing first uh, their uh, amendments on the text of directive or regulation. But then uh, if Parliament disagrees at the end, then the Council is not allowed to proceed alone. So the Parliament has a very uh, strong and uh, a very credible power uh, with legislative uh, procedure. And special legislative procedure rather uh, relates to um, the adoption of uh, uh, international agreements or enlargement or another um, issues where the uh, parliament decides by consent procedure. This means that they have no right of amendment, but they uh, can veto the proposal. And quite vague uh, consultation procedure, their parliament has advisory role. But with 200, uh, 2009 changes in uh, Lisbon, Lisbon um, uh, Treaty, uh, more and more power has been concentrated in the hands of the European Parliament, both in legislative and in uh, consent procedure. So we have covered one channel of uh, legit uh, legitimacy, so the engagement by people in uh, um, outcome of the European uh, Union legislative process. And this has been uh, through um, direct election in the European Parliament. And then the role European Parliament is playing in this um, output where the people's voice is expressed uh, through the power the European Parliament has through the treaties. But the Lisbon Treaty has also um, opened up another channel of direct civil society engagement. And it is so-called citizens initiative. So we know from previous slides that the commission has power of initiative. So the proposals are uh, drafted by the commission and then passed to the legislators. Here, we have a mechanism that ensures that the commission has to listen to European citizens, that in case of one million citizens who are nationals of the member states, in case they would encourage one million citizens together, encourage a commission to come up with a proposal um, in any of the fields that are under the treaties, then the commission has to respond, either come up with this proposal or give a reasoned opinion why they would think it is either not a competence or uh, that there are any other conditions why the Commission is refraining for doing it, but at least there is a direct uh, link between citizens' will and supranational institution commission. This initiative was first launched in um, 2012, and since then, uh, there have been numerous citizens' initiatives in place, and uh, the um, signing up for uh, the um, citizenship uh, proposals are through the um, member state-driven um, data platforms, uh, also with um, data protection rules, 
so that actually citizens sign up uh, through the member states uh, provided platforms, and then this adds up adds to the uh, to the voice of of the union. And there always is an um, um, either an NGO or initiator of the citizens' initiative um, uh, that coordinates uh, this action. Another channel of civil society representation is different interest groups. Um, as I will explained that interest representation or lobbying is considered to be normal and even uh, in the case of uh, the commission, uh, desirable um, channel of input of interests of European citizens. Um, and these can be business groups, these can be um, civil society groups, uh, different NGOs, uh, different movements, uh, confederations um, of different interests. So the institutions are open to input from interest groups, but in the remaining slides, we will discuss the channels of influence, how these in channels are reaching institutions and how open institutions are for lobbying. What kind of interest groups? These can be lobbyists, lobbyists of, uh, well, thematic interests like environmental lobby or trade union lobby, these can be uh, pressure groups that are um, acting on behalf of a, of a concrete topic or accountable group that wants to reach out. Uh, most often the interest groups represent different business societies or um, industrialist interests or pharmacy interests. And these can be also confederations, so Business Europe um, or um, environmental organizations, umbrella groups that are already consolidated, smaller groups in larger organizations. Um, civil society, non-governmental, so all these groups uh, are uh, can be framed as interest groups or lobbyists in the EU interest representation. There are good reasons to lobby um, EU institutions because as explained, the commission is coming up with the uh, proposal for legislative act. Uh, commission is also drafting different kind of strategies and future um, vision on priorities where uh, of European level engagement. And for this reason, input from public and from interest groups is uh, very desirable. Um, the European Parliament, however, is a format where already by treaty logics, the European Parliament is expected to represent people uh, by being uh, directly elected. So this is a logic of a lobby um, both in the Commission in, and in the Parliament. I leave out here lobby to the national governments because it is another route where lobbyists can work uh, by expressing views to national parliaments, to the governments, and then governments by participating in council work would then uh, represent citizens and lobbyists through their positions in legislative work. But my interest here is to focus on EU level, level lobby on supranational institutions. So it is already part of the treaty basis. 
because good governance principle in the treaty article 11 states that the EU institutions shall remain open for uh, input and be transparent, have a regular dialogue with representative associations and civil society. And also Article 11.3 stipulates that the European Commission shall carry out broad consultations with parties concerned in order to ensure that unions' actions are coherent and transparent. So for the first, the, there is a principle of openness as part of good governance. And for the second, actually institutions need this input because uh, the, um, this uh, by consultation process, uh, the institutions can use this opinion in, um, in, in um, working on actions that are adequate and, and coherent. For this reason, in political science, we are speaking about um, uh, two types of legitimacy. It is input legitimacy and output legitimacy. So to what extent people and uh, interests of uh, different groups are represented. And input legitimacy relates to, um, to the functioning of the institutions, um, how the members are elected and selected what the procedures are, how the decisions are made and exercise, exercised, and what is responsiveness to the citizens' concerns. So we were speaking in the previous slides about a lot of concerns that we saw the people are. So how institutions listen to these concerns. So. Here we are speaking about the lobbies, the accommodation of lobbyists' interests, um, their expertise, their advice into the policy making. So input from lobby groups into the decision making. Whereas output legitimacy would rather refer to um, to the um, public access and to the relevance and quality of institution's performance. This would then also be related to the eff effectiveness and policy outcomes for uh, society, for, uh, for people. So their lobby means that the lobbyists would incorporate standards that aimed at enhancing the uh, effectiveness and coherence of EU policies. So EU needs both input legitimacy and output legitimacy uh, to make the, the cycle of engagement of, uh, of uh, people complete. How did institutions managed to deal with input and output legitimacy. Um, so we will speak about the Commission and the European Parliament. And there are some differences. So for the Commission, the Commission has a strategic interest in accommodating different views because of commission providing a proposal, the commission's proposal needs to be realistic. And how to make it realistic? They have to measure uh, the possible impact or forecast the possible impact of uh, this new legislative act by already sensing the concerns of public um, interest organizations. So therefore, consultations for commission is in commission's interest. The more input, the better for the commission. Whereas the European Parliament 
perceives lobby a bit problematic uh, for the reason that there is already differences in political views and uh, that the lobbyists would target uh, one of political groups um, um, and there would, uh, by doing so, uh, would in increase imbalance. But also that, in fact, European parliamentarians are politicians and lobby on politicians is more problematic than um, input for executive power. So therefore, the lobbies, lobby in the European Parliament has been uh, always registered um, and uh, the um, lobby groups uh, have been not restricted, but at least um, registered upon their arrival. Um, including uh, working on code of conduct of uh, representation and access to the um, uh, European uh, Parliament uh, building. So the regulation of this process started uh, already in 1996. And then uh, and there was 2005, so-called transparency initiative uh, uh, that was reforming uh, the uh, regulation on lobbyists. And finally, in 2012, a new code of conduct uh, with regard to uh, members of the parliament uh, was laid, um, where there was uh, restrictions on uh, um, how, to what extent, uh, lobbyists could um, actually target politicians and um, and also restricting uh, politicians themselves in accepting also these um, lobby, um, including lobby gifts. Finally, I will end this lecture by explaining um, and voting some words on um, civil society uh, as uh, a pan-European phenomena. Is civil society in European Union pan-European? Other words, in other words, to what extent citizens of European Union feel affiliated with their country, with a member state, or affiliated with Europe? Do they feel as Europeans? This also is very relevant when we discuss European legitimacy, because for European leg legitimacy, um, the identity is also playing uh, quite an important role. It also could answer the question of uh, turnout in European Parliament elections, why people are hesitant in voting for European Parliament in some countries where they just don't affiliate themselves with the European Union. And answer to this is also seen in uh, the inquiry made by uh, Eurobarometer asking citizens of Europe to what extent they feel citizens of EU. And from all participating the only 27% definitely felt as European citizens. So one third of Europeans that were participating in inquiry were saying that they feel European and 40% of them said that they, to some extent, feel um, as European citizens. And on question on how attached to Europe they feel, 
9% were feeling very attached to EU and only 36% fairly attached to the EU. And here possibly we see also that the problem of legitimacy in the European project is not in treaty or decision-making mechanism or balance of power of institutions, but rather in communication or in affiliation of people in their daily life with the output from the EU, given that 67% of legislative acts in our daily life, so laws that we use in our daily life, that we rely on in our daily life, originate from Europe. And we have kind of legitimacy gap here. On the one side, people don't feel affiliated and attach. On the other side, Europe is influencing our daily life and Europe is also, European Union is a place where the problems that can't be dealt on national level are solved on supranational level and Europeans have expectations for that that Europe will do it as explained in the survey before the European Parliament elections. So I hope that this lecture has um, also um, encouraged some thoughts in um, rising questions about European legitimacy, about people's engagement in the European project, the extent to which Europe influence our daily life, and also the way how we are putting expectations for Europe, in particular with the upcoming European Parliament elections. Thank you for attention and follow RGSL lectures.